I want to begin by acknowledging the lands in which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, the Mi'kmaq, the Innu and Inuit of this beautiful province. And we encourage all of you and all of us to reflect on the lands where, where each of you are located and the indigenous peoples for whom these lands are territory are traditional territory. Very important always to remember that this land acknowledgement is more than words, it's a statement of values. So I'm delighted to be hosting this session. I love talking about teaching. I love uh, listening and learning all the time about teaching. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to showcase and speak with some of our faculty instructor champions who have been recognized with the 2020 President's Award for Excellence in Teaching and Graduate Supervision. Well done to each of you. I want to mention that these awards, they honor individuals who have generated intellectual excitement, fostered the development of students' skills and interests in their disciplines, and contribute to a positive teaching and learning environment at Memorial. So there are four awards in teaching and grad graduate supervision that recognize educators at all stages of their careers. We have the award for distinguished teaching, the outstanding teaching award for faculty, the outstanding teaching award for lecturers and instructional staff, and also an award for outstanding graduate graduate supervision. All of these are so important. You know, I'm going to just adjust my camera a little bit just for that. It's just you know, we think a lot about how research impacts a community, but teaching, you touch the lives of students. You shape the future through teaching. So and I, when I think of graduate supervision, I remember my PhD graduate supervisor, I would send him my chapters and he would get them back to me like within 48 hours and how he supported and helped me get through my PhD while I had two babies when I was doing my PhD was phenomenal. And I remember when I finished, I wrote a letter to the president of the university, University of Calgary, saying what an impact he'd had on my life. So we do, through teaching and our work, we touch students' lives. So today, we're going to be talking to four of our 2020 award recipients. For the first 30 minutes or so, I'm going to ask a few questions and just chat them up so we can hear about their teaching, especially how it relates to our conference theme, getting to the heart of teaching. You know, I always say, say university education is about uh, the head, the heart, and the hands. And I think that's so important, hands because of experiential learning, head because of our intellectual stimulation, and then the heart because of the passion we want to uh, evoke in our students. So. After our panel, so that theme is fabulous, by the way. After our panel discussion, all, each of you can, can join us, any one of our 56 participants. I want you to ask our panelists questions. You can ask me questions. We want to hear from you. This We want to see this as a discussion. Now, without further delay, I'll introduce our panel and get started. So joining us today is Dr. April Pike. In the Faculty of Nursing, the recipient of the award for Distinguished Teaching. Hi, April. Oh, you're muted, April. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, great. And Rebecca Miley, the School of Science and Environment at Grenfell Campus, a recipient for Outstanding Faculty Teaching Award. Rebecca, well done. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. We have Jana Rosales in the faculty. Now, did I say that right, Jana? The last name? Rosales. Rosales in the Faculty of Engineering Applied Science. And congratulations to you, the recipient of our award for outstanding teaching in the lecturers and instructional staff. Thanks so and, much. and Dr. Christina Botero in the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, recipient of the award for outstanding graduate supervision. Christina, well done. Thank you. It's a okay. pleasure to be here. We're gonna jump right in. Uh, thank you to all four of you for joining us today and being part of the showcase on teaching excellence. So first question, you know, the theme that we have, the conference theme that I spoke to, getting to the heart of learning, focuses on the importance of meaningful relationships 
and making a positive lasting impact on learning experiences at Memorial. What's the significance of this theme in relation to your teaching practice? And what does getting to the heart of learning mean to you? And how do you connect with your students? I want to call on April first to respond. Thank you very much. And you know, a perfect theme given for nursing and that uh, my area of expertise is in cardiovascular health. So thank you very much for adding that to the venue. So for me personally, I think getting to the heart of learning is uh, fostering a sense of purpose in our students that really inspires them to learn and to continue to learn. It means trying to cultivate a sense of what it means to be a nurse and actually what it means to enact the process of nursing. To me, so it really means spending time to strategically construct opportunities for the students to become socialized into the profession of what constitutes, as I would say, the heart of nursing. And I think the, the relationship between the student and the teacher is critical to the learning process. So uh, as a professor, I take great time in connecting with all students in the program, regardless if they're actually in my class or not. Uh, I am a strong believer of academic and student citizenship. As such, I try uh, really hard to be visible within the, the Faculty of Nursing, and I consider myself a bit of a whimsical soul. Uh, I'm always around and, you know, I can be dressed in professional care, but I can sort of brunch with the best of them at the best of times. Uh, so I, you'll see me quite often within the School of Nursing at uh, student spaces and student events. And I think this is a time and a place that I can really get a feel for who our learners are. As a result, I also get a bigger picture or, you know, the inside scoop of what we say in Newfoundland, what's going on at the post office, and really get to delve into the diverse needs of our students. Uh, frequently, I know the students by name before they actually enter into my classroom or the clinical setting, which I think is uh, phenomenal. So, one good example that I was thinking about with the research the theme, sorry, of getting to the heart is my experience with the heart and stroke subchapter. And this was a project that came about about eight years ago with a few of the students. And I was approached as part of a course to develop some sort of opportunity for public engagement. So the students actually sought me out outside the course and I was so happy to get involved. So this started about eight years ago. And this is where students across the curriculum, not only uh, we have one to four years, collectively got together. And our goal was to increase education and awareness about heart disease. So this provided me the opportunity to engage students in many learning opportunities way outside the traditional classroom. For example, we do the red dress event, and I don't know if everybody's heard about it. So this is a fashion show across Canada. About to raise awareness about heart disease. So we get people living with heart disease, researchers in the areas, educators, uh, people in the community all come collectively together. Uh, this event connects the students with the community, with the Heart and Stroke Foundation, individuals living with heart disease, sponsors, and other healthcare disciplines, which is really important. So as a result of this, this cohort of students have published. They've received research funding, and most recently we did a video uh, for the Canadians Heart Alliance about women in Newfoundland living with heart disease across the province. I think in doing activities like this, they have developed a strong sense of social responsibility and the requisite skills to be a nurse leader. And I think most importantly, they've done it by doing fun. So I think it's really important to engage our students to have fun with them. And sometimes a lot of subconscious learning takes place and you help them develop other life skills. So I'm a strong believer that getting to the heart of learning starts by connecting all students and being really truly authentic in the relationships that we create with them as a teacher. Thank you so much, April. Lots, lots of interesting things for us to learn and ponder about. So now I want to, uh, Rebecca, I want to know if you could respond to the same question, please. Sure. So, yeah, when I first read that theme, getting to the heart of learning, I took it as getting to the bottom of learning. And, and then I realized it was more about, you know, um, connections and relationship. And then I realized for me, one is a natural consequence of the other. Like that's how I make those connections. So my teaching philosophy really focuses on getting students to truly understand the mathematics. So I, I teach math. Um, 
you know, yes, they have to memorize some formulas and they have to follow algorithms, but I, I, I always try to keep the focus on where did that formula come from? Why does that algorithm work, that sort of deep learning? And the unfortunate reality is that a lot of students in math come in on day one with the assumption they can't understand it, they won't understand it, you know, and that causes lots of anxiety. So I try right from day one to just put the energy out there that I I believe everyone can understand this. I'm going to help you all understand that. And it's so nice, even on that first lecture, to see everybody's anxious, defeated faces just start to relax and engage and, and smile. And that can be, you know, first year calculus where I've taught in summer intercessions where half the class are, are repeating the course and they've failed it one, two, three times before. Or it can be math majors or minors at the third year level taking the first, you know, upper year course and feeling so intimidated and then getting that feeling like, oh, OK, I'm, I'm capable of doing this. So it's very empowering. I think it helps them lower their guard and lose some of that mental block. Um, and then some of the things I do throughout the semester to kind of keep that messaging going, um, I'm always trying to, you know, make, focus on the understanding. So um, one thing I like to do is to just pause during the lecture and let them do some math. I mean, I do some classes completely flipped, but even in non-flipped courses, just instead of me doing three examples on the board, I'll stop and, and say, okay, now you guys do this example. And the first time that I do that, the students are very taken aback. They're not used to it, right? Sometimes they're used to really just taking notes passively for 50 minutes. And so making them do it, it's it's so great. They get their hands on it. Um, and then I get to see, like, are they understanding? And um, it's uh, it, it even, it's it just projects that messaging even further that I care about whether or not they're getting this, you know? I always relate teaching math to teaching an instrument and I think, you know, how how well could you teach piano lessons if you didn't let your 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 student touch the piano, right? Like they need to touch the math themselves during the class. So that active learning component. And then other little things like just asking for a thumbs up for, you know, who understood that? Give me a thumbs up. And then if they didn't, they can just passively let me know. They don't have to raise their hand and say, I didn't get that. They can just not put their thumbs up. And if I see half the class didn't put their thumbs up, then I can re-explain it. And again, it's so beneficial for the students. It's beneficial for me. It immediately informs how I'm going to teach that lecture. And it's continually broadcasting that message that I, I, I want you to understand. I'm not going to let you get lost. Where did you get lost? Let me figure that out. So, um, and then at least to all the other wonderful things that this theme is about, right? Then they want to come to your office hours and ask for help with the course, with their life, whatever, right? And it, it creates that lasting impact. And uh, yeah, it all it all starts for me with that message that you can do it. I'm going to help you do it. Thank you, Rebecca, for those that insightful response. I appreciate it. So we have a second question. Um, our one rewarding aspect of teaching is that many educators talk about the feeling you get when you make a real connection with a student. What stands out to you as one of your best or most rewarding teaching moments? And what about that experience made it stand out? I'm going to ask Jana to go first. Thank you. So I think about this in two different ways, actually. So there's the times when I'm thinking, you know, oh, isn't this everything's so great and I'm so jazzed about what I'm doing. Um, and then there's also the, I don't like what's going on here right now. This is really uncomfortable, but but we're all learning something from it. Um, so an example of the first one would be, um, I, I so we teach mandatory courses in professionalism and communication and ethics and engineering. They're large classes, um, but I, I was teaching one of these large classes, uh, but had a, uh, an, an optional experience and it was based in experiential learning and I, I partnered with them, the experiential learning folks there and I took a small group of people um, to the Tree of Life community which is a an eco community about an hour outside of St. John's on Salmon Year Line and they it's a it's a like an artist retreat a yoga retreat um, but they're very much into the sustainables of uh, or the principles of sustainable design and so I took a, a group of students out there to, um, you know, help the Tree of Life community with the things that they needed done, which is like cutting 
branches and brushes and mossing a water pipeline. And the students themselves got to look at these like micro hydro projects and um, biomass projects and all these other different kinds of real life examples of sustainable engineering. So and it was, you know, so it's hands on as Dr. Tim was saying, there's the, the, the head, the heart, the, the hands. Uh, it's hands on. It was one of these kind of communal things. It's nature based. Um, there was a reflective component at the end of the day when you're you know, you're all you're dirty and disheveled, but you know you're thinking, well, what what did we learn here from from doing this? Um, and and it was an opportunity for students who are you know oftentimes in these conventional programs, often in these very set in like the oil and gas industry, to so take a step outside of that and uh, and and be able to see what else is out there for for engineers who are interested in things like sustainable design. That experience wasn't accessible to everybody, but for me it was is really gratifying to at least be able to take a slice of my large class uh, and expose them to that. Um, and then there's those other experiences of, okay, this is really uncomfortable, um, or you know, I don't like what's going on here. Like, it, it's the rewarding experience is sometimes the reward doesn't feel like a reward at the time. Uh, so there might be students that I don't want to engage with because they're prick, they feel prickly, or they're brash, or there's student teams that are on the rocks because of some poor dynamics, and we're trying to troubleshoot what's going on there, um, and. And you just kind of have to lean into that. And so my best teaching moments are those times when I like I suck up, you know, my discomfort, and I, I lean into it. And um, it helps not to think of them as difficult people, but rather to engage with curiosity and and think, okay, well, I wonder why they feel that way about this situation. I wonder why they see it that way. I wonder why they're like that. And then the reward is, you know, helping a team use their own tools to troubleshoot. The reward is for me to. Kind of keep my humbleness about um you know how to how to help people and not you know just kind of i guess um to the 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 reward is kind of to go okay i'm living what i'm i'm, I'm kind of living what i'm teaching uh you know there are other examples of you know having to go through hard times where like i teach my class about resilience and wouldn't you know it um you know the the day i'm working on a lecture for resilience i lose my whole morning work of, ex of, of of my whole morning's work and you know that's <laughs> pretty upsetting but you bring that to the classroom you say look i know what you're going through this is what happened to me as well um so you know the the best experiences aren't always the the ones that are making me feel really great at the time but they're the ones actually that i i learn the most from um, yeah, so I, I think those are some of the, the examples that I bring to the table. Great, great examples, Jan. Christine, wondering if you could comment on this question. Uh, sure. Um, really, really touched by some of the stories I've been hearing so far. So, uh, you know, trying to reflect on my own experiences in these ways, a little bit different than how other people are viewing it. Um, I, you know, I view being an academic as a really privileged position in so many ways. We, we, uh, you know, impact members of our community directly and indirectly. We have these long relationships with our graduate students, as well as our more short-term relationships and long-term relationships with undergraduates. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two examples because, of course, some of these, you know, you talk about moments. Most of the time, it isn't a moment as much as a, a culmination of an experience over years with individuals where you see them succeed at the end. So I'm going to talk about two uh, experiences that I had that really um, impacted me in terms of, of how much we uh, can do to help our, the people that we interact with, or at least influence them, if maybe helps not the right word. Um, so one was when I was doing outreach. So one of the things we like to do in chemistry is to get out there and, and wow people with how much fun we have. Uh, it's maybe not a good and accurate reflection of what we're actually doing in the lab every day, because it's a lot more uh, lights and explosions than uh, I hope to ever see in my own lab. But uh, uh, it's a lot of fun to get out there and do that. And I was do, doing an outreach with my graduate students in a kindergarten class. And uh, one of the boys in the class came up to me afterwards and said, I want to be a scientist when I grow up. And I was like, oh, that's great. Uh, now, I ran into his mother recently and him and he still wants to be a scientist and he's in grade six now so 
you know, it seems like it's something that you want to do with your students to get them out and have their own experiences with outreach. Uh, and maybe it's just some time filler for the students that we're actually delivering this program to, you know, giving the teachers a break, maybe doing something that's kind of cool. But the fact that we can actually change minds in terms of what they want to do for their careers and show them that that these opportunities are available to them and, and help them make some decisions about their future, even that young. I know it's not it's kind of early, but uh, it was really an exciting thing for me. The other one that I'll talk about is is the experience because I did get an award for graduate supervision and of course that's really um, what what I was thinking about when I was focusing on this was uh, one of one of my recent graduates. Uh, she is a refugee and a widow, <clears throat> and um, she had fled her home country to to Syria and then had to flee Syria after her husband died as a refugee and she had been living in St. John's for a couple of years and was sort of getting her on her feet and she was looking for opportunities and she came to my office and asked if I had anything for her. And I guess you could say I took a risk by hiring her, but you could tell that she was just really committed and, and had a lot of perseverance and, and very often that's what you need to be a successful scientist. Um, and it was a struggle for her. She'd been out of school for more than 10 years. She had two um, school-age children that she was responsible for, all the economic uh, issues associated with that. And going to university isn't necessarily going to be, you know, a great income, even though we do find our graduate students. Um, but by the end, as we, as we went through the whole process, watching her go from this demoralized state, which she certainly was when she first came to my office, to starting to find herself again, to be the person she was before all this tragedy happened. Her life was really exciting. And, and in the end, she asked me to be her guest uh, at her convocation ceremony. And I can say that it was one of the most proud moments I had, one of the most touching moments I had to be able to sit with her children and watch her cross the stage with all that confidence uh, and so much pride in all of her achievements. It was really you know, one of the things that makes being an academic, you know, really so powerful and so impactful in my own life. So looking at how their successes really make me feel wonderful about the efforts that I put in is is really, you know, one of the, the best things I take out of the position and certainly experiences that stand out for me. Christina, that's, they're excellent examples. You know, and as you were talking, I was thinking about when I was a grad student and um, how I had I had four I have four children, but I had two of them, my two youngest, while I was doing my PhD and how tough that was financially and emotionally and all of how how I struggled through that. Sometimes I look back and I think, I don't know how I did it, right? You know, having four kids, one with unique learning needs, having two pregnancies. So, you know, I, uh, professors like you are the reason that I got through it. So thank you. Or on behalf of all of those students you supported. Great example. I am I am really proud of all of the work you do. I want to just say to uh, the participants, think of questions you want to ask. You can even put in a question that's just a general one or specifically to one of our panelists or even to myself. So I want to get to the, uh, the last question. In your experience, panelists, with with the remote environment. What did you learn about your own teaching? And do any of you have advice that can help others connect learners to each other, to their instructors, to their course content, to their community? Just advice on what really worked for you on online learning and what uh, what be you how you feel it benefited your teaching. Um, I think I'll start with you, Christina, because I had you were the, the, the last one in the first round. Sure. You, you tricked me there. I was like, oh, I'm on mute. I, I have a break. Um, <laughs> um, this 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 year, um, I taught two courses remotely, and I'm really thinking about this. I, I did them very differently. The first one that I taught was in the fall, and it was only 25 students. Uh, I did my I did recorded lectures, but I had my image on the lecture because I wanted them to be able to connect with me, at least see me. Uh, and then I held office hours and I would meet with them. And it was really a, a really nice experience. I had great interactions with the students, but they were at the third year and, you know, they kind of knew what they were getting into. And so it was a good semester. The winter, I was teaching an introductory chemistry class for the first time. I'd never taught the class. And um it was a fairly large class, over 100 students. Uh, 
and having not used uh, the electronic material in, and so we, we were kind of learning at, at the same time. And what I found was that I had to focus more on how the students were receiving the material rather than how I performed. Because as a, you know, as academics, I think professors, we often are very concerned about our performance because it really is a performance when we're lecturing. Um, and so I really uh, uh, shortened the, the messages that I was giving and I was really very clear. So I, instead of, I really typically spend lots of time on one slide talking and talking, but because of the way we were delivering it, you can allow the students to stop. So it was more about the clarity and the conciseness and giving them really very specific tools. The other thing I learned uh, was that I had to um, make more effort to give them really good uh, instructions about what I was expecting each week to really uh, allow them to have like a, a you know, a checklist. Okay, I did these things that I needed to get done because it, it, introductory chemistry four lectures a week plus their labs, it was a lot of work for those students. And also to reach out to them and watch the words that I use when I'm sending emails very, very carefully. Um, I can remember I, someone had asked me about their performance and it was right at the end of the semester. And I'm like, well, I was going to say, well, unfortunately, you're going to fail because you didn't do the labs. And then I backed up and I said, well, it's going to be difficult for you to succeed rather than telling them they were going to fail. Um, so using uh, kinder words, more thoughtful words when I'm communicating with them was really the other thing that uh, I really focused on when teaching. So, Great tips, Christina. What about you, April? Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, I had, uh, I echo many of things about what Christina has said, but this semester for me has been challenging. I've taught uh, a master's research course on mixed methods, and I also taught a uh, final clinical experience for our new graduates that are graduating this upcoming weeks and they're actually in the clinical setting with COVID was on, on was happening and you know i uh, i come from a qualitative research background so i thought i was a really good listener and many times over the course of the term i had to pause and take a big think about the experience of the students and how I was going to get access to them in the clinical situ in setting. And I'm gonna focus on that because that's what I found most frustrating. And I think for myself and the students, because it's a very uh, uh, difficult time for them. You know, they're under a lot of pressure. It's their last course. They're supposed to be at the top of the game. And it's really important for instructors to be, have a presence and be actually on the unit to support them answer any questions and there's more going on at that time i'm sure people can appreciate in the context as opposed to just dealing with the professor to dealing with the patient the family other healthcare discipline and uh, faculty have a good role in helping them navigate things because most times like things don't always go you know tiptoe to tulips so i had to sit back and think a part of it was for me for my sense of, I think, is my uh, paternalistic approach is to how am I going to support this group of students when some of the, you know, public health guidelines say not going to the units. So I had to be really creative uh, to have a win win situation. So as the uh, regulation eased, it got easier for me. But like Christina, I thought I had to give really clear guidelines without almost like do A, B, and C. I had to become really technological savvy. I worked hard on knowing the equipment and different platforms. And I use text messaging all the time. So I could actually have a presence in the building, in my office where I'm alone, and text students and say, hey, are you okay? And they would text back and forth different policies. And when the restrictions released, I took them out of the study and had actually conversations in my office and said, how was it for you? And then I tried to tease out some of the feedback about how, as I move forward. But one of the things they really appreciated was the fact that I had open texting. Now, for some professors, this may, may, may you know, not be the appropriate approach, but for me, it worked really well. And I found that it gave students a sense that there was always someone there to support them. And then these high level courses, that's really, really important. And you know what, it made me feel a lot better as well. It made me feel like I was a good teacher because I wasn't feeling very good about it. And part of it's because I didn't have access to the clinical environment. 
So I think having a presence, however you create that presence, is extremely important. Even if it's just a text, hey, are you okay? And get a yes, I'm fine. You know, so I think there's different ways you can provide support. And like Christina said, it doesn't have to be a long winded thing. It's just knowing that someone's there. You need them. Thank you. But I know that, you know, when I was, te I did teach online courses and I know the work, the work is tremendous that you put in. Uh, you know, I created my own online course that I taught a knowledge translation. It was a graduate course. And I would find that I was, I, uh, you know, I wasn't very efficient when I first started teaching it. I, because I responded to everything all the time. I was constantly working on it. So I know the tremendous work it takes to do online courses. Just going to take a minute, Megan, to see if there's any questions. And if not, then I'm going to ask um, uh, our other two panelists to respond to that question. So no questions yet for me. So if you want to keep going, Dr. Timmons, oh. I'll pop in. Perfect, Rebecca, and then I'll ask Jana. What are, uh, any tips on online learning things that you like to share? So I've been very luckily on sabbatical this year. <laughs> and so I've skipped a lot of the pandemic uh, stress. Oh my God, Rebecca, that's like a knife in our hearts. All of us are looking at you. We want to just yell. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but I did obviously have the, the, the end of winter 2020 and I taught, um, I've taught one online course and I've developed three online courses. There so, you go. Yeah, so I do have some, you know, thoughts to share. Definitely, so when I developed the online courses, which is similar to how I developed um, flipped courses, just creating really small chunks of material for the students to digest at once. So, like, I used to cap my, my videos at five minutes. Uh, so it was really just boiled down. Uh, I, sometimes I could take a 50-minute lecture and turn it into two 50-minute videos and then some associated exercises so it's really cutting it down to the you know the real bare bones but then flesh it out with the examples and the exercises and, and the homework um, when I was teaching remote at the end of last winter um, having live sessions I, I felt were really good like it was you know it was sort of all ad hoc um, but just and I already had seen the students in person because we had you know it started the semester in person so it's different than completely remote, but it was really good to have live help sessions for the students, I think. And a lot of them showed up, you know, more than if it was just an office hour in a regular semester. A lot of them showed up and I was able to do some things with them. And one of the things I was able to do that term because I just didn't have a big class was they would submit an assignment and they, it was a particularly abstract concept we were learning and I would... I would mark the, like correct their assignments digitally on an iPad and record a video of myself doing it so that I could send it back to them and they could have that fee as if they were, you know, with me and, and getting that feedback one-to-one. -one. And then with their permission, I shared that to the whole class. So all the students were able to get these really great feedback on common errors and things like that. So that's all I'll say because I, <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't in the trenches like everybody else this year. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, but you were in the trenches, it, you know, when you've done any online te teaching, it's like being in the trenches. Well, all teaching is a challenge. Um, even if one of our participants has a tip, something that, or any of you want to respond to the questions that I've asked panelists, just say, um, comment, and we'll, 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 we'll love to hear from you. Jana, any comments from you on the last question? So uh, even though I have given, you know, developed and given online, you know, fully online courses anyway, uh, the the pivot to bringing the in-person classes online, everything takes longer and you just, you have to kind of give yourself, allow yourself that uh, acknowledgement. It, it, things take longer. Um, and so there's some, you know, major choices that you have to make about, okay, you know what, I, I'm going to cut some material. I'm going to try to trim it off the, the fat. Uh, and, you know, as uh, some of the others have said, just try to keep your, your keep things a bit shorter, whether it's the video choices that you're making or the, the lectures that you're giving uh, in more bite-sized chunks. Um, and I, I found that giving variety, but also giving options for people um, for assignments, for however you want to submit the assignment, um, the flexibility of, of deadlines, um, and and record like really thinking about where the students are coming from because before you know you weren't thinking maybe about their bandwidth or 
you know, when you have international students and they're in a time zone that's half a world away and how, you know, what, what, what do you expect them to do to be able to participate? And so kind of having to run both a, a synchronous course, but think of ways to make it asynchronous so that those who simply cannot join you for that time are able to do that. Um, I did find that there's ways, some of the, the benefits of um, the remote semester were that there, there are ways for to engage those who, who might not otherwise pipe up. I mean, so I, I'm in the large lecture theater and if when you're asking a question, you're mostly going to get crickets. Um, but when you have things like the chat box or when you've got polls and stuff like that, everybody feels like they can contribute a whole lot more and that that's really useful. Um, something that I did specifically for my my um, live classes this term was uh, to do an arrival practice. You know, it, it just took two or three minutes. Uh, those of you who joined for the keynote this morning when I talked about contemplative education, uh, we'll, you know, kind of connect it to that. But just some kind of practice where, you know, we and our students spend so much time in front of these screens now uh, and they everything just kind of blends together and giving them just that moment to, okay, switch from one thing to the next thing, and now we are here, and now we're going to uh, just take a moment and and monitor our breath or do a body scan or do a free write or something like that that just gets them from one place to, to where they are right now and helps them to be more, more present and focused. Uh, so I, I think those transition practices, those arrival practices were, were useful. Um, you know, making more of an effort for people to get to know each other through discussion forum introductions. Uh, so using the discussion forum function uh, to to have people do introductions uh, to make sure that there were, you know, tools that could bring people together, like peer review software that I was using or polling. Um, sometimes there's just silly chat box questions just to kind of bring some levity to what we're doing. Um, and then maybe a couple of things I'd want to say is that um, I so I, I adapted a course, my two courses to uh, focus on resilience and how students could build resilience. Um, but part of my intent was to give assignments where they could step away from the screen. So the part of this was, okay, go have a conversation with someone that matters. And I, I you know work this into the the theme, the professionalism theme of my courses. Um, but but get them outside or get them doing something that wouldn't be having them in front of a screen all the time um, just because I realize there's so much more uh, time being spent you know in front of your device. Um, I think I took a bit more care to understand more about mental health so really kind of tuning into resources and trying to find out as much as I could about how to support student mental health and well-being uh, was a really important thing that came to the fore in the remote semester and then I just say that um, there are a lot of best practices for remote teaching out there um, through thing, places like CITL, you know, the Chronicle of Higher Education, there's societies for education of whatever it is your discipline is. So for me, it was, you know, uh, engineering education. There's actually a lot of those resources out there that you can tap into uh, to just find out what best practices are. And so um, going and sussing those out was a, a big help to me because you know I, I knew then it wasn't just my struggle everybody's kind of going through this together and, and let's see what we can learn from each other thank you jenny you know i listen to the four of you i realize one of the attributes that you've all brought to your teaching is your authentic self and i think if there's any bring if you could bring who you are to your teaching you know share your love and passions with the students it sounds like that's what you do is you bring your authentic self in and that caring, uh, the reason that you go went into academia in the first place, that deep caring for students comes through. So I'm gonna pass it over to Megan because some of you participants are stepping up finally. It's like a class. Now this is like a test for you. This is a class. So I want you to think about something you you that resonated with you from what of the four panelists said and type in that comment. I want each of you to try to think of a question or something. So this isn't just going to be you sitting back. I want you now to start participating. Put in your comments, put in your questions. We won't get to them all, but Megan, take it over. I'll certainly try my best to get to them all. So I'll start with a comment that we had from Stacy Alexander. And she said that, Rebecca, I wish you had taught me math in university. I think I would have been much less intimidated based on your approach. 
And next I'll flip over to a question that came in from Tom Cooper in business. He said the visiting keynote speaker yesterday, Dr. Peter Felton talked about the importance of developing student relationships. One of the challenges we have had is students who may be proverbially falling uh, through the crack due to learning preferences and mental health issues related to online learning. Does the panel have any suggestions about dealing with students who are struggling, uh, reaching the unreachable students? And I'm going to pick on you guys and first I will go to April to see if you have any feedback. I was thinking you were going to do that because of the nursing profession. So reaching the unreachable student can be like, as Tom said, can be quite difficult. And there are 1 of the 1st things I always do is I. Make it very visible on on my course shell of where to go if you're experiencing problems. Um, you know, give them specific links. As well as that, when I monitor my students, one of the key things is I look at the participation within the discussion forums and look at who's participating, who's not participating. And I do that early in the first couple of weeks of the course, and I actually reach out to them. And I do send each student an individual email saying, Hey, how are you? Uh, I noticed, you know. You know, do you have any concerns? How you doing? How you find in the course? And that is often a window of opportunity to get to a student to respond to you. Another thing you can do as well is if you're doing group discussions or group projects, you know, you can sort of infiltrate the group and ask, how are you working together as a, a group? And most times I find the students are pretty forthright. You know, I'm having a bit of trouble here. I don't gel with this. Can you help me with this? So. To reach the unreachable students, particularly during remote times, is difficult. But if you have like a, a, a lens looking for particular issues and know where to find them, for example, the discussion forums, then you could sort of start teasing out and sort of, uh, you know, sending them messages. Uh, out in the field, I, like I said before, it's, it's a lot of work, but I use the text messaging. And I do ask them, how are you feeling? I find this might be, you know, with the COVID particularly, you know, if you need any help, is there anything I can do? Please let me know. And once I do it, once people reach out and quickly identify. And I thought I was a really accommodating professor. And I got humbled a lot because I'm not as accommodating as I thought. And when I spoke earlier about pause and think, I paused a lot. And as I move forward, I realized, well, I always knew that students had different learning styles, but really it brought me back to my roots and was a strong reminder about, you know, you get caught up in the rush of teaching, the deadlines, and not all students move at the same pace. So I, as I move forward, I've decided that I'm going to have a lot of more fluidity in my course and different assignments to tap into diverse teaching styles. And I've learned over my over my years, and I do the remediation for people who are having trouble with our national board exams. And I use very subtle teaching approaches. For example, I'll draw stick men and get and get people to identify the different parts of anatomy and what diet you would have for the kidneys. And it's something as low level as that can really bring the concept to the student. So if someone is having trouble. I really try to tease out what type of learner they are now. Are they a visual learner? Are they an auditory learner? And then I say, okay, go to this YouTube video. So when they're experiencing problems and compounded by mental health, I think spending some extra time helping them to identify how they learn. And Memorial has lots of resources for that as well. But offering different diverse approaches is important for them as well. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, do you have anything to add about reaching the unreachable students? No, I think I think I, I liked um, April's response and I think it's something that I'm still working on myself. I, I, I again, I didn't teach remotely a lot, so I, I can only imagine how much more difficult it is to reach those students in that setting. Um, in person, I mean, when students come to me, when, when they're, we're at the point where they can come and say, I'm struggling with this or that, you know, uh, mental health wise, you know, I direct them to the, to the right places. 
and then in terms of different learning styles, yeah, I think just making sure that I'm presenting things in as many different ways as I can. And I always like to give um, checkups during the semester. So even one month in, I'll put out an, an anonymous survey during the class to ask a whole bunch of different questions. You know, are you looking at the solution keys that get posted? Are you getting help with your assignments? And, and you know, how does this class make you feel? Sometimes it's you know, pick which of these emojis best describes how you feel in this class. Is it happy, sad, worried, sleepy? Um, so just trying to keep them engaged right from the start so that they can give me that feedback because it's really hard to do anything without the feedback from the student. Thank you. Jenna, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I would have to echo what April and what Rebecca were saying in terms of just the check-in, you know, in in that you don't want to leave it to the end yourself. You're hoping your students don't leave it to the end, but there is some responsibility on you as an instructor to be seeing what the progress is like. Um, and, you know, the, the, I mean, certainly there's the question that maybe that's two different um, questions with those who are struggling with mental health issues and other issues as well. Uh, I, I think by creating a course experience that that is flexible and that kind of offers a um, choice and that is clear with those expectations I think maybe that can help anyway set the tone uh, and that students you know kind of see that oh this professor is, is is thinking about how the course is running and and seems maybe that they would understand what I'm going through if I need to to reach out to them so kind of setting the tone I think might help students come to you earlier you know, when they need, and, I, and I've certainly had my share of, of students come um, and disclose things that they, and I, and I feel like that's a big act of bravery on their part. I mean, I was talking about guts this morning uh, in the keynote, and, and it takes a lot of guts for them to to come to me, and, um, and you know, again, you, you recognize and you uh, refer, so, you, you know, you kind of recognize the, the limits to what you can do but you also have to kind of understand where uh the rest of the supports of the university work and actually i was, I was sitting in on a, a webinar about you know student mental health and one uh, person actually gave the advice of perhaps instructors should kind of take a look at how what the process is like familiarize yourself with say the counseling center's intake process or you know have the the website on um you know, e easily accessible to to pass on to to someone who might need it, uh, just so that you kind of understand who and what you're you're uh, referring your student to. Um, and then, so the but then the other part of Tom's question was, well, then there's the unreachable students. So there's people who's gonna who are gonna come to you, but then there's all those also people who just kind of disappear. Um, and yeah, I would just have to 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 reiterate the whole idea of just having those check-ins and um, and and seeing, you know, if are there ways that you can kind of poke people uh, to to just see is everything okay? Do you need anything? And um, you know, just as a reminder, here's what's left, and give some some gentle reminders. And and also under, you know, you don't know what they're going through, but to at least say, yep, you know what, this is a tough semester for everybody. Um, you know, let me know if there's anything that you need to talk about. You talk about. Um guts and how it takes that for students to be able to disclose that. But maybe if you back up a little bit further, what are some strategies that we could use to initiate relationship building in, in the classroom, face-to-face -face or online, so that people are able to disclose? Because I think we need to start at that initial relationship building and certainly being online makes that more challenging. Um, Jana, since you were just talking about it, do you want to keep going or should I flip over to Christina? I think maybe just quickly I'd say, um, acknowledging at the start, that this is here we are in a tough semester and, and even, you know, if and when things go back to the way that maybe we're more used to, to just acknowledge that, you know, what everybody's doing, it's, it's very demanding and there's high standards and, but we're all human beings and we're in this and my job is to, you know, kind of help you out. Um, I can't solve all the problems, but I can help you find the people who can do that. And so, um, you know, in my course on professionalism, we were talking about stress and resilience. And so just at least kind of giving people that insight into how their own brains and bodies work uh, and when kind of what to look out for, what to start noticing about their own uh, reactions and responsiveness. Um, you know, I'm able to work it more into the, the content of my courses, but I think uh, it's it's entirely 
uh, appropriate for for everybody who's teaching just to kind of acknowledge like it's not business as usual so you don't just forge ahead as if it were you make some acknowledgement of well here's what i've changed as a result uh here's how i want to try to build connections between people here's you know what you can expect from the experience christina do you have any examples of strategies that you use to initiate relationship building yeah so it was funny because you know i tried sending the emails and to be honest this this, some students will respond to an email and others won't. And when we talk about different learning strategies, I mean, really for me, it was looking at progress. So Brightspace has some nice tools. You can actually go in and see whether they've actually accessed the videos, whether they're, you know, how much time they spent downloading notes or looking at various resources, how often they come. And that's a really nice way to identify students who really are not engaging at all. They're not going to respond to emails either. So. Um, you can check and see whether, you know, they're having a problem accessing the, the, the you know, the, the Brightspace, for example, or they're not being able to log on to your uh, electronic homework system, or they don't have the money. And so following them in sort of a little bit more closely, I don't want to give away all the secrets because not all the students know that we can poke around and see whether they're there or not. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is one way to get at those students who really are the unreachables. Uh, and in chemistry, we have a lot of that because, of course, chemistry is one of those programs, particularly at first year, where a lot of different um, university degree um, programs require chemistry. So we've got lots of students who don't necessarily really want to be there. <laughs> they just have to be there. So so catching up with them and seeing what their needs and goals are um, is another way to get at it. We have a question in here from Shane Regular where he talks about a, a few years ago there was a Gazette article where a professor is using Snapchat as an additional form of communication to have students contact them. I'm going to share a link to that article uh, with you guys once I'm done reading the question. Um, he said this was really well received. It seemed quite innovative. Do you think at Memorial we need to learn from this example and think with more creativity and strategy when it comes to communication with students? Dr. Timmons, oh, Christina just put up her hand. So Christina, go ahead. Do you mind if I say something? But I think we have to be careful with the numbers of technologies we use. Not everyone uses every kind of platform. We can see really quickly that people have really abandoned Facebook in the droves unless you're like over 40 and sharing pictures of your kids or something. Um, and so Snapchat really among young people is kind of viewed as a bit of a like a, uh, you know, a flirtation piece of software. And so you know, we, I, from my experience, the more different ways we communicate, it often creates more confusion for the students. If we can be very clear about the types of ways we're communicating, then they get less confused. I know I was using my regular email as well as the one in Brightspace, and the students, if they didn't get the email response right away, they're like, well, I'm not sure if you're checking this one or that one, so I'm sending it to both. So I think clarity and also the timeliness of the of the feedback is important, but not getting sucked into being really trendy. I think, you know, it it might be cool, but they're moved on to Discord or Twitch or, you know, some other platform within the time that we've decided we're going to take up the cool thing. So it's a bit of a trap, in my opinion, anyway. What does the rest of the panel think? April? Uh, I, I totally agree. I only use my text messaging for my clinical group, and I find that works really well. Uh, you would not catch me on Snapchat interacting with students. Uh, I think we need to be careful as well, because there's a lot of confidentiality issues surrounding that. But one of the things that I've actually used within the Brightspace is the e-portfolios. So students actually can go on and develop a really lovely e-portfolio and talk about a multitude of factors and actually publish it to the group. And then after the course is done, they can actually hide it and they, or they can keep it public like LinkedIn and continue on to build their e-portfolio as part of their professional repertoire. So I, I've used that in one course continuously over the term for the last, I'd say, ooh, eight years and students love it. In the article. Megan, uh, may, oh. may I just say to the participants, I thought I asked you guys to make a comment each of you to say one comment of something you learned from our panelists and i have to say only four of you have put a question or comment and come on put one comment i learned that one you're being clear about uh communication electronically is a good thing like one comment so before you leave just put a comment in i think our panelists would like it and i and i'd be interested to 
to seeing what you learned or what resonated with you um, before you sign off. Thanks, Megan. We got uh, probably another minute or so, right? Yeah, we have another four minutes and then Gavin will come right into this room. I'm sure he's here already, but he'll take over and start the uh, the conference reflections. And about that Snapchat article, it was actually being used to, um, if people, I believe it was chemistry or math, if they were having trouble with a specific problem, they could show their workings rather than trying to type in an email to explain what they were doing. Being able to show it in pictures, I think, was a, a really helpful tool and that the students really appreciated. So Denise Carew said, perhaps we could mention that we are concerned that one or more of them could disengage and become unreachable and ask them what we could do to prevent that from happening and what we could do in the case that it does happen. Really interesting approach. Any thoughts from the panel on that? Dr. Timmons, what do you think about pushing it back to the students? Well, any way you can engage students is important. So, you know, saying them what works for you, uh, you know, what resonates with you. Uh, what did you, what is one thing that you'll remember from the lecture today, or you'll remember from our, uh, you know, our class today. Um, thanks, Tom and Daphne. I see you're putting, you're putting stuff on. So anything that, that we can engage them to let us know what works for them is a good thing. I really did like um, Peter Felton's um, what I really one of the things I really learned from him yesterday uh, was that check in um, addressing the class, whether that was the the in person, you know, I know near the end of the term, one of my best students might just feel like they're overwhelmed. So whether that's the, the kind of in person address to the class or whether that's uh, an announcement or an email to the entire class, just to say at the midterm point that we, we know that you're stressed about stuff and there's lots of things that you need to balance but don't disappear so kind of being preemptive in that and saying before you think about disappearing if you can hear my voice you know right now um just keep in mind that that i'm here to help you not disappear uh so and that's not something that i had really thought about doing but it's something that i'm gonna adopt and and try out for for next term i see kelly ann and luann Post the comments. Thank you. You know, the one thing I learned early in my teaching is that you always tell the class, you always review what you did last day, tell them what you're going to do today. And at the end of the class, ask them what they learned in that class. So, and then the next class, you get them to get them to tell you what they remember from the last class. You tell them what you're going to, like any way you can get them. So you always preview and you always reflect every chance you get to teach um, when you teach. I think it's really important. And that helps bring clarity to you as a teacher, because then you have to think about, OK, what did I teach yesterday? What am I going to teach? So I go forward. You know, it's been a great hour. And I know I learned a lot. And I hope all of you did also. Uh, pet, so your comments are coming up, which I see. Uh, being authentic, Peggy said, is really important. And I think the teachers that have been authentic in my life have really made a difference. So I want to thank our, again our panelists. Well done. Our moderator, Megan, the moderator. She's been doing it a lot. And, and to all of you, the 65 of you participants, for joining us and participating on the Dialogue and Teaching Excellence. So I know it's our last session on these uh, for this year's Teaching and Learning Conference. And our STEAM leader, Gavin, is about to close the event with conference reflections. Well, I hope you enjoyed every moment of these last two days. And um, please remember, what you do makes a difference. You not only touch students' heads and hearts, and you, you'll get a chance to also, and many in much of the work you do, their hands, but touching their hearts is the most important thing you can do ignite the passion of learning in those students and you do it all the time and your work is noble work. And I thank you for all you've done for our Memorial students. And thank you for taking the time to come on this session because le learning about teaching helps build excellence in teaching. Thank you to all. On to you, Gavin. Thank you, Dr. Timmons. Uh, I know that you're getting uh, virtual and real applause. Uh, we've had a number of moments where we've, uh, there comes the virtual applause, where people have unmuted their mics and applauded along. So I think this deserves, uh, this one of those moments. Let's um, unmute our mics and, and thanks Dr. Timmons for asking our questions.
thank Megan for uh, being a, a, a great moderator. And I also want to take a moment to say thank you to uh, Dr. Pike, Dr. Milley, Dr. Rosales, and Dr. Botero for joining us and, and sharing your insights. Um, Dr. Timmons, uh, you uh, asked us to uh, comment or, or, or provide a reflection in the Q&A um, to help make our uh, learning concrete as far as what we want to take away. And I have to um, admit that um, when I'm in uh, sessions like this, I'm just sitting on my hands because I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of great ideas and uh, I also want to help. Um, one of the things that I heard um, in the, uh, in, in our, from our panelists, especially around um, the, the question that uh, Tom asked about students who are disengaging, um, who potentially aren't, um, who we're not re reaching in the ways that we and hope. Um, I heard lots of great suggestions, including using um, the learning management system as a tool to help us. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the themes that I heard in the conference, but one of the themes that I've certainly heard about the heart of learning is care. Um, and there's a tension sometimes between connecting with humans and the technology that's in the way. But I, I just wanna point out that the learning management system in some ways can be a tool to augment the ways that we care uh, and just provide a really interesting example around this. Um, our particular learning management system, uh, which is called Brightspace, um, has a tool um, where you can create um, a note that is personalized to the learner because the learning management system knows the names of learners uh, in, in our courses um, and that it, the message um, that you would write um, would be sent automatically, for example, when a student hasn't logged in for five days. Um, and uh, that's an example of where we know from the literature that uh, a personalized note from an instructor or a faculty member um, uh, helps demonstrate um, that, that sort of notion of care and engagement, um, but also using the learning management system helps manage some of the labor. Because one of the bigger questions that I have with all of this is the tension um, between our, our work, our effort, care, and the feeling as though um, we are, especially within that this last um, academic year, uh, really um, uh, struggling, uh, let's be frank, um, to manage all of our varied and different um, obligations. So I, I just wanted to um, provide that as an example of where we can use the tools at hand to um, help reduce the burden the, uh, of care uh, in the moment from our own uh, awareness. And, and we can actually use a, a learning management system or an e-learning tool to help, um, to help support that. And so um, that's called a, uh, my spouse is banging her keyboard. I'm not sure why, maybe in, uh, <laughs> In, uh, in agreement, I don't think so. She's got uh, uh, headphones on. Um, uh, it's a way of um, enabling us to show that we care, but also using tools and technologies to help manage our own labor. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, so um, I just have a few keynote uh, housekeeping items to talk to uh, and uh, talk about rather, and then I'm just gonna um, share a little bit of a mind map that I've been creating over our time together. Um, my goal is to just spend the next five minutes talking about these and turn the floor over and be done in, in all of us be done in kind of 10 minutes. So I, I would appreciate, and I know that I can see the participant numbers are still here. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I promise not to be too, um, take too long, uh, but I, I would like to take the opportunity to just uh, note a few things and share a little bit of, of the themes that I heard in the conference. The first thing is that if you attended this morning's keynote, um, Dr. Rosales has shared her Mentimeter data, the two questions that she asked. Um, you can access it through our conference page, which is on the Bryce Bates conference site, um, and you can do that at the end of the session. Um, I'm uh, now gonna turn uh, to, to the what I said I was gonna do earlier and provide a little bit of synthesis around what I heard. Um, this is important to me because one of the things that I always attempt to do at teaching and learning conferences like this, I think somebody said this this morning that um, uh, the conference is a, is, it marks a moment in the sort of cyclical nature of the academic year. And a teaching and learning conference for me is a moment to stop and take stock, reflect and think about how I wanna go forward, perhaps fill a tank a little bit. 
So I always try to leave with what um, a good friend of mine, a colleague called a golden nugget. So what, what is that one thing that I'm gonna take away and I'm going to try either um, if I'm teaching in the spring semester or summer semester, or um, as I uh, come back to the classroom in the fall. Uh, so one of the things that if you hadn't been thinking about it explicitly that I'd really like to encourage you to do is consider what that golden nugget will be from the different sessions that you participated in. Um, I had the um, pleasure of teaching a um, graduate course in university teaching and learning at a number of different institutions. And one of the um, tensions in teaching a, uh, the one course that maybe some uh, PhD and master's students will take in, in university teaching is that teaching is so complex that it's really difficult to spend 12 weeks and talk about all the different things um, that uh, a future faculty member will need to know in order to be successful in the classroom. It's impossible. And so um, noting that uh, that, that was impossible, um, I would teach um, critical reflection because as educators, we're lifelong learners. And as we're thinking about higher education, we're thinking about how we can continue to improve. Your participation over the last two days is evidence of the fact that you're a lifelong learner. Uh, and I, I taught um, uh, a model of critical reflection um, that really had three stages. Um, it talked about uh, asking students to describe what's happening in a particular moment um, and ask the question, so what? Why, why did you notice this ha was happening and why was that important? But where I'd like to focus is, that, uh, is the last question. And the last question is, now what? Um, the now what um, calls for you to explore uh, what you're going to do differently because of your experiences um, and how you're going to apply what you've learned. Uh, and I do think that um, there is the opportunity for us to uh, reflect on some of the themes that we heard. Um, so important, um, and I heard it again and again, was uh, the a feeling of connection. Uh, and that connections between ourselves and our students um, have a very salient uh, and, and immediate um, uh, response and, and impact on student learning. Um, I was struck uh, from hearing Dr. Peter Felton simply say that um, the, the, the asking the question of students in a genuine and meaningful way, how are you, um, has um, a significant impact on students' sense of belonging and feeling as though um, they're part of a learning community. Um, I heard earlier today in a panel um, speaking with students who uh, may not um, necessarily uh, uh, feel as though they have a place um, within our, our classrooms, um, that ultimately um, the best way that we can be inclusive in our learning spaces is being open to respecting the humans that uh, are in the classroom. And that, that aligns with this notion that student presence matters. Um, and I think that that's a shift that we've been um, seeing when it comes to teaching and learning in higher education. Certainly every student needs to be engaged um, with the content of a course. Uh, but I think we've really experienced, especially in these last 12 to 16 months, that content isn't enough. And that in order for students to feel as though they can engage in the kind of learning that's meaningful during a global pandemic, we have to connect with one another. And, uh, and so that was what was really um, impactful for me. And I'll just share one more theme before I close. And that is around pausing. So um, often um, we uh, leave these kinds of conferences feeling as though we need to engage immediately um, and, and make changes right away. Uh, but I heard on a number of different occasions, either through um, the exploration of co content complet contemplative there, I got the word right, uh, pedagogies, um, or even thinking about how we're going to engage with indigenizing the university, that metaphor of a car with square wheels, pushing, 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 and then all of a sudden the change will take place. Um, that uh, we may be too action oriented. And in fact, it, we do require some time to stop, reflect and think. So as you're thinking about what you may do, I think you do have a bit of a luxury here to have a few days or weeks, go for a walk, um, contemplate and think about what it is that you want to do because pausing seems to be 
another way that we can acknowledge um, the importance uh, that learning has within uh, the work that we do.